Well, uh, Vice Admiral Griggs, thanks for joining us. The um, the Lewin, uh, the Dart report into the Lewin uh, abuse uh, claims, it's fairly damning, uh, but it does vindicate what the victims have been saying for many years now. What's your initial response? Well, it's a very confronting and difficult document to read. It sickened me, parts of it, absolutely sickened me. And um, what I think, uh, I think, you know, when you look at what happened there, there was a failure of the Navy of the day in its duty of care for 15 and 16 year old boys uh, who were in an initial training facility. No one, no one should have to endure the abuse that was endured by these boys. And particularly um, when they'd stuck their hand up and volunteered to serve their country. Um, that, that has been, you know, that, that is probably the most disturbing part when you read the document from my perspective. The report does state pretty clearly that defence um, knew that the abuse was happening, uh, that nothing was done to stop it on many occasions. Um, it's a, in a sense, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a fairly explicit condemnation of the sort of culture that was there at the time, isn't it? Oh, I think there's no doubt about that, um, no doubt at all. And uh, of course, there were attempts uh, made in the early seventies with Justice Rapke's report, and um, you know that has been uh, assessed by by the Dart, of course, and, and there are some criticisms of that in the Dart report. Um, we did see a significant drop in uh, incidents of abuse after the, the Rapke report, but it did continue through the 70s and, and on in smaller numbers into the early 80s, no doubt about that. And the Rapke report itself, I mean, although it was, uh, uh, it, it, it had some public uh, airing, there was a lot of it that was redacted and remains redacted. There was a lot of it, um, presumably that's because uh, it contains names, but there was a lot of it that was held from the public even, even then. Um, there has been a, a tendency, hasn't there, to not really address, not confront these problems over the decades? In the past, I think that's true. Uh, I think that's very much changed now. And I would hope uh, that people would see that Navy's been part of that change. And if I, you know, if I look at the recent case on board HMAS Ballarat last year, we have, I think, uh, issued five or six statements since that incident occurred, uh, very much of our own volition, trying to keep the public informed of what we were doing, of the action we were taking. Because I think that's the big difference, is that we are taking action. As soon as we know of these things occurring, we're taking action. And we have a very strong program, a cultural change program in Navy that's been running for five years now, New Generation Navy, which has put values and behaviours at the centre of what it is to be in the Navy. And I think we've made some incredible progress there. Uh, are we perfect? No, we're not. Do we still have incidents? Yes, we do. But what we don't have now is a Navy, or an ADF in fact, that ignores what was once ignored. One of the recurring themes uh, in all of these abuse cases in the ADF over the years has been this uh, reluctance uh, to report these problems, this culture of not reporting. Um, I know things have improved, and um, I guess the Ballarat um, example is one of those where you have responded fairly quickly, but even still there is still a feeling uh, that there is a culture of that people are uncomfortable reporting uh, these abuses. Uh, is it fair to say that that, that that is still the case? I think, uh, I think what comes out loud and clear in, in uh, the Dart report into Lewin is that the victims themselves are very reluctant to report and um, of course the the overall culture of the organisation around it can either increase that reluctance or, or make it easier but there is this there is a base level of reluctance by a victim to report because of, of a myriad of reasons. Uh, what I think is important going forward from our perspective is to have a culture that encourages people to seek the support they need uh, and to make sure that they have confidentiality and that the process is focused on them and that's if you know, we're familiar with the with the SEMPRO 
Office for Sexual Assault. And how we deal with sexual assault now in the ADF is very, very different than we did even two years ago because it is a victim-focused process. And I think that's the important thing is to, to create the climate that allows people to come forward and be comfortable and for them to feel in control of that process because I think in the past they've all realised that they're not in control of the process and that's probably been a barrier that, uh, that we, we needed to break down. Over the years, uh, many of these men have lodged claims for compensation with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, often those claims have been rejected, mostly they've been rejected because there were no witnesses at the time uh, and that the offences weren't reported at the time. Um, that doesn't seem to be... Uh, it seems like one arm of, uh, of government is working against the other arm of government when DVA doesn't accept these claims, but DART does. Well, of course, as you know, DART, uh, DART is working to a very different um, level of proof to uh, DVA or even to criminal uh, criminal matters you know, beyond reasonable doubt. But DART works on the basis of plausibility and, and clearly has a, has a very uh, extensive process to, to reach um, a decision that something is plausible. Um, Veterans Affairs has a different a standard of proof uh, and um, I guess what I'm saying is, do you think that's adequate? Well, I, look, I think I think that is uh, that is really something that uh, is outside my lane, and I'm not trying to dodge the question, but it is a matter for for the for the minister and for the Department of Veteran Affairs. Mm. Because you can understand their frustration, surely. I Absolutely, think, you know, <laughs> of course. DART accepts their claims. Yes. Um, they get a reparation payment, but they still need continuing ongoing medical treatment. They still need. Yeah. Uh, they still have a claims for pension. Entitlement. No, I understand that. Mm. Uh, the victims we've spoken to say what they want above all, um, apart from money, apart from anything else, uh, is an official apology. Uh, will you give them one? I have. I have given victims of life. I've been involved in the restorative engagement program uh, and I have spoken to victims from Lewin and I have told them how sorry I was that they were subjected to what they were. I have told them that, in my view, the Navy failed in this duty of care. And in just saying that again, I'm saying that to all the victims of Lewin and all the victims of abuse who have been in Navy when they've suffered that abuse. Do you think there should be something bigger than that though? I mean, we've had uh, symbolic apologies to the stolen generations, etc., from from the Parliament. Is this a case where uh, something like that would be appropriate? I, I, have, uh, I have no problem at all with uh, something that is meaningful that people will accept is meaningful and genuine. And the advantage for me of being able to do it in person with, with some of the victims is they can make their own assessment of how genuine and, uh, I've been. What about the question of the Royal Commission? Now, I know the, uh, the report said that the Royal Commission wasn't necessary into the Lewin cases in particular because they could be dealt with under the current institutional, Royal Commission into Institutional uh, Sexual Abuse of Children. Uh, do you think that's appropriate? Well, I think, uh, I think ultimately, of course, uh, the, the issue of a Royal Commission is for government to decide. But uh, Len Robert Smith and his team have given this a lot of thought. Um, and their basic principle has always been from the time that the DART was set up and remembering that the DART is, is not part of defence. It's, it's deliberately at arm's length so that people can come forward. Uh, has been to do no further harm. And I think that that comes through very clearly in the section of the report that talks about the Royal Commission. So I, you know, I absolutely understand uh, where, where Len Robert Smith is coming from. Um, I, I believe that if the Royal Commission of Child Sex Abuse uh, looks at this issue, um, then that will, that will give further opportunity to, to have these matters aired. Because there's no reason, is there, for a defence to be treated any differently from the Catholic Church, the Salvation Army, no. or anyone else who had care of you. Of course not. Uh, presumably that would mean that people like yourself would appear before, would be forced, would be subpoenaed to appear before yeah. the Royal Commission, you'd be happy to do that? Of course. Hmm. Do you think it, um, something like that would, I mean one of the criticisms I guess of DART is the limitations of the DART process and that um, a Royal Commission might uh, present an opportunity to, um, to actually take things further than DART can. Do you see that it, it could? Uh, it, it, I think it may or it may not. And, and I think that's part of, uh, you know, when you read, again, what Len has said in the report, I think that's, that comes through there. 
um, that he's not convinced that it would uh, make a fundamental difference to the public understanding of what happened. Uh, this report does make make the public very aware of what happened in in, in um, very uh, great detail. And I think you know we we all owe a debt to to those who've come forward and had the courage to tell their stories because what that's been what that's allowed me to do is to connect what happened in the 60s and 70s with what we're trying to do with our own cultural change program now and to get not only me but other senior leaders in Navy one-on-one uh, -on -one with victims of abuse listening to their stories understanding the impact understanding how their lives have been destroyed how their dreams have been been smashed how their careers have, have been robbed from them in many ways um, that is a very powerful thing for for us in looking forward and how you know the, the resolve that we have to make sure that Navy is um, you know goes forward and, and that this sort of systemic abuse that occurred just can't happen again. You say in your statement that um, there will be some that attempted to dismiss that are, are tempted to dismiss this report as referring to events of 50 years ago and, and that it lacks relevance to today. But you say that would be wrong because there's much to be drawn from this experience. Well, what is there that you're drawing from? Well, remember that Lewin was an initial training facility and we still obviously operate initial training facilities. People are not 15 or 16. But the, the key thing you're doing in that initial training phase is you're transitioning someone from being a civilian to, um, in, in our case, a sailor or an officer. That's a challenging transition. And I think what, what I want to use this report and the, and the stories of these, of these men who've come forward is to reinforce to our people what can go wrong if we don't have the right quality of people, which we now do, and that comes through in the report as well. Uh, the right quality of people in our initial training institutions, the right processes, the right culture. And so I think that they're, they're the sort of range of lessons that we can, we can draw and apply directly to today. But I mean, you are also fairly confident that this sort of thing is in the past, although uh, the challenges, yeah. there are still challenges that remain in this area? There, there are always challenges that remain. Um, I don't believe there is a systemic issue in Navy in our initial training facilities. In fact, if you look, uh, and we do a lot of measurement uh, of the cultural change that we're, we've been undertaking for the last five years, if you look at the two initial training facilities, uh, they have a, uh, they're at the forefront, as they should be, because uh, as the report makes clear, they remain the sort of highest risk areas for this sort of thing to occur, where there's that uh, very strong power imbalance between uh, new recruits and, uh, and those who are looking after them. Mm -hmm. And so you're confident that nothing like this could happen again? In a systemic sense, I think, uh, I think I am confident that systemically this couldn't happen again. Uh, am I confident that individual incidents won't happen again? I think that would be very naive because incidents will occur from time to time. The important thing goes back to do you have a culture that allows people to raise concerns and in a way that is not threatening to them and do you have a culture that acts on those concerns? Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks Michael.